Okay, uh, good afternoon. So welcome to the last but least session of our SOAS Centre of Taiwan Studies um, uh, seminar. Last but least. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Last but least. Ah, last but least. How cool. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to welcome back uh, uh, Daryl Stewart from uh, Hong Kong's Linan uh, University. Um, we've, we've heard him give an yeah, we've only had this is the one uh, talk already on uh, Taiwanese indigenous uh, film. Uh, he's also uh, spoken um, last year, uh, so, so we're, we're great fans of his um, due to his academic work, but also his translation. Uh, just I think it was yesterday, one of our uh, CTS fans asked us to pass on how much they enjoyed his translation of Ormini's Stolen bar, uh, Bicycle. <laughs> uh, and of course, we've, uh, a number of the books that he's translated uh, have been launched at, at SOAS. For example, Horace Hur's uh, uh, Fought on Carnation Lane, and Shi uh, Yu's Wedding in, in Autumn. And, and, uh, uh, and on his previous visit, he also talked about his experience of translation. Uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, he's, he's, trans he's as enthusiastic about his translation as his um, uh, work on, on film. Um, and it kind of reminded me about why I wasn't suitable to be a translator. I remember when I, remember when I, when I graduated from university, I went to um, uh, a translation agency in, in, uh, in Thailand. And very quickly I realized this wasn't the thing for me. Because um, of that attention to detail. And that's one of the things that really came through. Uh, in his earlier talks on his translation experience, his passion for, for really that kind of minute detail. Um, and um, so, on that note, we're going to have another translation themed uh, talk, but quite a different one. Uh, this time it's going to be on film. So let's give Daryl a very big uh, welcome. Uh, thanks, uh, Davis, for the introduction and uh, for having me here. It's an honor. Uh, thanks to Jia Yuan for um, the printouts and for making everything possible. Um, we're all impressed with, with your attention to detail. And thanks to all of you. It's been a long week. Um, <laughs> do my best um, to tell you about a research project I've been working on for the past uh, four years. Uh, it's become kind of an, an obsession. It may be a, a lifelong obsession. Uh, you can imagine that I might have a lot to say about it, but I'm going to try to try to keep it as short as possible. Um, okay. So the title of my talk is uh, the translation of Saedek Balai, Saedek Balai into uh, Saedek as uh, interpretation. So, um, who has seen Saedek Balai? <laughs> who has seen this movie? And put up your hand. Oh, if you haven't seen the movie, please put up your hand. If you haven't heard about the movie, please put up your hand. Everyone's heard of the movie, that's good. Have you heard of the Usha uh, Shijian, the, yeah. um, the Usha incident? Yeah. Uh, Musha Jiken in, uh, in Japanese, the Musha inc incident? Okay, great. Um, so some things I, I don't have to say because you know it already. <laughs> that's always good to know. Um, so the We'll start with the title of the film. Um, in, um, in, in Chinese, it's Saedek Balai, and that's a transliteration of um, a phrase in, in, uh, in a language called Saedek. The, the language is called Saedek. How many syllables are there in the word Saedek? Saedek? <laughs> Four. Three syllables. Yes. I'm overemphasizing the final. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the stressed syllable, the main uh, stress in the word. There's one main stress in every uh, word in the language. Say it. Like you can use body language. <laughs> so the second syllable, the penultimate syllable, the second last syllable is always stressed. All, all other syllables are unstressed. Uh, what sound is the cue? Is it a quo in English? No. What does Q mean in uh, the International Phonetic Alphabet, if anyone knows? 
I, I'll demonstrate again. Uh, you have to open your mouth wide and make a kind of K or G sound. But it's not made in the same place that a K or G sound is made. It's made with your uvula. How many of you know what a uvula is? You all have a uvula. It's the thing that hangs in the back of your mouth. And very few languages use the uvula to make speech sounds. But this language does. So you open your mouth wide and say, and that's the sound. Say, hey, there. It's not a K, but it sounds like a K if you're not used to it. And this word, se'edep, uh, means person original, person or people. It can be singular or plural. And as I mentioned, it's uh, extended in meaning. It also means the language that these people speak. And it's become an ethnonym. An ethnonym is a word for an ethnic group. So in the Japanese era already, it had come to mean uh, the people that speak this language and uh, practice a certain kind of culture, you can call the culture se'ede as well. Is that clear? <laughs> and then bale is bale, uh, penultimate stress, meaning the first syllable is stressed, two syllables in, in the word. And it's uh, an adverb or an adjective, meaning real, really, uh, true, or truly. So real person is basically what the title of the movie means. Real person is an odd collocation that people don't say real person very much. Like, I mean, Dabith will say he's a mensch, but we won't say he's a real person. Dabith, I've always felt you're a real person. Nobody would say such a thing. We can say a real man, that works. And a real woman, can you say she's a real woman? Sounds a little bit odd. But the closest you can get is kind of real man. And in their culture, a real man was somebody that had completed requirements for adulthood. Uh, and originally, that meant headhunting. And they still use the term today. They don't still headhunt today. So their idea of what it means to become an adult has changed. Of course, women could also become real uh, people. They had to learn how to um, uh, weave clothing uh, to clothe the, the members of the, uh, of the village community. OK. So hopefully, partly, this will be uh, educational and not just about my research. <laughs> my research, in a word, is um, the translation of the screenplay for the film into this language. The, the film is about the Musha incident, the Usha incident. And the Usha incident took place in Japanese and uh, Seide. But at the time, nobody was around to record what people said. And all of the historical materials we have are in Japanese. And so based on these historical materials, uh, a guy called Wade Sun, a, a director called Wade Sun, wrote a screenplay in the 1990s called Sadika Balai. But the screenplay was in Mandarin, because he can't speak Japanese or, um, or, uh, or this language. So um, the film depends on translation. He had to have the screenplay translated into Japanese and Sa'edic, or he wouldn't have been able to shoot the kind of movie he wanted, a movie uh, mostly in the original language. It's actually entirely in the, in the original languages. One of the interesting things about the movie is that the screenplay's in Mandarin, but there's not a single word of Mandarin in the movie. It's all translated in this language. So my argument basically is that the translation is not a carbon copy of the Mandarin original screenplay. It's different in really interesting ways. And that we can describe the translation as uh, an interpretation by the translators. The translators were obviously speakers of Se'edic. An interpretation by the translators of the Usha incident and of their own culture. So it's an interpretation of the Usha incident in terms of their own culture. And it's also an interpretation of their own culture. That's basically it. So the uh, film is based on the uh, Musha incident. Um, and I think everyone has heard of it. <laughs> so this will just be a little bit of a review on October 27th, uh, October 1930. The Gadaya, Se'edek, Chief Monarudo, led the warriors of six villages in an attack against the Japanese at the hill station of Musha in central Taiwan. Today it's called Usha in Mandarin. Now it's, I, I use hill station. Hill station we normally use in, uh, in India. So why did the British build hill stations in India? Because it's really hot in the summer. 
They wanted to go up the mountains to escape the heat, and it's also a way to extract uh, natural resources. So the Japanese motivation to build Usho is about the same. And um, uh, one of the main natural resources they wanted to extract was wood, and they needed a lot of wood to build infrastructure at Musha to turn it into a hill station. Um, and so who is going to cut down these trees and haul them to, uh, to Musha? Would the Japanese be doing this work? No, it's too hard. And there weren't enough Japanese people in the, uh, in the area, so they got local indigenous people. They got the Se'edic to log and carry the, uh, the wood to uh, Musha so that they could uh, lumber it into um, uh, boards and then build buildings in, in Musha, post offices, uh, police stations, and schools. Um, one of the problems was that it was corvée labor, so it was forced labor. They forced them to do the labor, and they were supposed to pay them, but they didn't pay them very much, and often didn't pay them at all. So that was one problem. The other problem was that these people kind of believed that they are descended from a tree called the Pusukohoni. Pusukohoni is a tree. It's half rock, half tree, or half tree, half rock. It's unclear exactly what the nature of this, of this origin is. But um, the word Gahoni is tree. <laughs> so they believe they're descended from a tree. It's like a totem ancestor. And now they have to cut down trees in the forest and haul them to Musha and not get paid for it. Um, if it were you, you had to do this work. I, I don't think you'd be very happy about it. <laughs> and I think you know what eventually has to happen. They, they say is enough is enough. And so that's what happened on October 27th. They attacked an assembly of Japanese people uh, at a sports day for three schools in the area. And they killed 134 people. Um, so what's going to happen then? The, the, the native population um, have attacked an assembly of colonizers. We've got to punish them. And so the Japanese uh, punish them. Uh, and uh, one of the ways that if you're a colonizing uh, power, one of the ways to rule the colonized is by dividing the colonial population and getting some of them to help you. Collaborators, you have to find some collaborators. And so in this case, they hired um, uh, Dota Siddiq, Dota Siddiq people as mercenaries and got them to headhunt the Degadaya Sa'edic. And you'll notice a similarity in uh, this word and uh, that word, Sa'edic, at the top, the Degadaya Sa'edic, and this word, Siddiq. Uh, this word is uh, stressed, the last syllable, Sadiq. It's only got two syllables. And then Doda is another sub-ethnic group. If Sa'edic is an ethnic group, then Dagadai is a sub-ethnic group, and Doda is another sub-ethnic group. And today it's analyzed into three uh, sub-ethnic sub groups and three dialects, Dagadai, Doda, and uh, Truku. But all you have to know to appreciate the movie is uh, Dagadai and Doda. Is that clear? Okay, and that is basically what the film covers. That's what the film was about. Um, this is um, kind of the aftermath. The survivors of the Japanese reprisal were pl placed in shelters where they were attacked again by the Dota Siddiq in the second Musha incident. And the survivors of this second attack were moved in 1931 to a village north of Puli called Bluban, that's what the, the local people called it, and in Japanese, uh, Chuanzhongdao, or <laughs> Kawanakish Jima, Chuanzhongdao, which we can say in Mandarin as Chuanzhongdao. And then after the words uh, been uh, renamed again, uh, Qingyu. And then, the Gadaya uh, land was given to the Dota as a reward for their service to uh, the, uh, the emperor, as a service to the Japanese. Any questions? Is that pretty clear? Okay. So I already mentioned that there's not a single uh, line of Mandarin in the film, even though the film is uh, in top, even though the screenplay is entirely uh, in Mandarin. It's translated into Japanese and Sa'edic during pre-production in 2009. And so in this presentation, I discuss the translation into uh, Sa'edic by a team of translators led by Daki Bowen, who uh, served as on-set language uh, consultant onset Sa'edic uh, language consultant. Because the actors they hired for this movie were not native speakers of Sa'edic. Imagine. 
<laughs> I speak English, and they want to make a movie in Dutch. But they can't find any Dutch speakers, and so they hire me, and they get me to deliver my lines in Dutch. <laughs> to make it his seem historically authentic. That's the kind of situation they have here. I'll discuss examples of intentional translational shifts. Um, a translational shift is, is basically a mistranslation. <laughs> it's when you say, uh, when the translation is, very, is unexpected. It, it doesn't seem very close to the original. It seems like the translator has done something. The translator has been irresponsible. Um, but any time you notice a translation shift in a translation you're reading, um, you should keep in mind that the translator is responsible, not just to the original text, but to many other people and many other things. And um, I'll describe these translation shifts as being part of an interpretation of the incident, as I said, uh, and this interpretation was founded on their understanding of Sa'idic culture, which may, have, may or may not be entirely accurate. They were translating the screenplay 80 years after this incident took place. So uh, their uh, understanding of it and their understanding even of their own traditional culture 80 years later uh, is limited. Okay, my emphasis on understanding contributes to the study of translation into endangered languages in terms of cultural translation. I'll come back to that at the end. Okay, this is the uh, head translator, Daki Spao and Guming Zhen. And you see he's wearing the earphones and the uh, parka because he's on set. Uh, during uh, the filming, filming of, uh, of the film, and he's listening to uh, the audio. He's listening to the lines that the, um, the actors have delivered and, and decided whether it's good enough. And if it wasn't good enough, he had the right to ask the actors to do the scene again, which is to say he had the right to ask the director to, um, to re <laughs> reshoot a scene if it wasn't up to, uh, to, to his standards. And you can imagine this would be kind of troublesome for the director. And it would also make filming much more expensive. And they didn't have very much money to make the movie. So um, um, at a certain point, I think they told him, uh, listen, <laughs> no, it's good enough. <laughs> it's, it's good enough. For 99.99% of the audience who does not say, speak Sa'edek, it's good enough. It, <laughs> it's good enough. OK. Um, but uh, Dakis uh, Bowen did not think he was good enough, and so after he did a draft of the translation, he uh, asked two other um, Duran, two of his colleagues, one is Bowen Nawi. You see he's dressed up in traditional uh, attire. He is Zheng uh, Chou Sheng in, in Mandarin. He played a character in the movie. He played the father of Monoruto, the chief that launched uh, the, the attack on the Japanese. Ruto Luhe is his name in the movie. And then uh, Iwan Bedding is uh, my friend. It's kind of the reason I'm here today. She uh, uh, was so kind as to reply to my email in 2011, um, asking a silly question about Sa'idic uh, ballet and what, what their notion of, of that is uh, today. So um, these three people were together on the Degadaya Sa'idic uh, translation. Remember, just now in my explanation, I emphasized that there are two subethnic groups or two dialects into which the film was translated. And these two guys uh, were responsible for the Doda Siddiq uh, lines. Mostly uh, the film was in the Gadaya, but about uh, 10 or 15% was in uh, Doda. And so I think it's really nice, because in 1930 and 1931, they were killing each other. Uh -huh. <laughs> they were attacking the Japanese or attacking each other. They were at each other's throats. Their grandparents we're, we're trying to kill each other. And then 80 years later, they're working together. So I, I, find, it, I find it very moving. And that's part of the reason why I've kept uh, doing this research for, for, for three years now, four years now. OK, so what, do we, what kind of translation shifts do we see when we compare the uh, Mandarin original to the Sa'idic translation? Well, here's an example. So in Mandarin, Dan Wu Fan Kang, the Juishin, the most famous line from the film. And in English it means, but my determination to resist the Japanese is firmer or more solid than Mount Chilai. Mount Chilai is the biggest mountain, the tallest mountain in the vicinity. It's about 10, 15 kilometers away from Usha, and it's uh, 3,700 or so uh, meters tall. 
So it's a fitting symbol of this guy's resistance to the, the Japanese. In, um, in Sadic translation, what happens? Puhurinas, dugiat, utsuitsik, kenkere, lukogenmu. And uh, this guy's not a native speaker of, <laughs> of the language either. He apparently does a really good job. So I'm just going to play this one clip. And it's thinking. There we go. Three most famous lines in the film. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's the only clip I'll play for now. So, quite a bit faster, eh, than, than I was able to read it. He speaks a language called a tile. Uh, there are many varieties of a tile, many dialects, um, and he doesn't understand uh, Sa'edic at all, but uh, he did a really good job delivering these lines. Um, and the translation is basically pretty predictable. It's what you'd expect, except for the name of the mountain. Um, the name of the mountain is here, Degiak. Degiak, you see the Q again, Degiak means peak or mountain. Mm -hmm. And then Utsu, Utsu, Utsik. You see here that Utsu seems to repeat some of the, the, uh, the sounds in, in Utsik. Utsik means hot pepper, or pepper, or ginger. It's a place where a lot of uh, hot peppers or ginger uh, is grown, or where a lot just happens to, to grow. So it's, it's not the same mountain. This is not a translation of Mount Chilai. I asked Aki's Bawan, what were you thinking? And he said, well, I don't actually know the name of Mount Chilai in our language. We probably don't have a name. Even if we did, Monorudo would hardly take this mountain as a symbol of his resistance to the Japanese because it's too far away. It's part of somebody else's uh, hunting ground. You would be foolish to go into somebody else's hunting ground that far away. It's part of Truku, a territory. So if they went into this, into this territory, they'd get their heads cut off. So it doesn't make any sense from their perspective, from Dakis' uh, perspective. So he substituted a mountain that's a lot smaller. It's only about 2,500 meters uh, tall, and it's really close to uh, his home village, really close to Monoruto's home, home village. And that's why he changed it. Uh, it's called Fushi um, um, San in Mandarin, or, or at least in Japanese. So it's, it's shaped like Mount Fuji, and it's like a, a mini Mount Fuji close to uh, the chief that led this uh, uh, rebellion's home village. Okay. Okay. And the um, repeated uh, sounds at the end is because it implies numerousness, that there's lots of hot peppers. And I think this is an even better symbol of uh, Munorudo, Munorudo's resistance to the Japanese than uh, Mount Chilai, because uh, it's like it, uh, the hot pepper that the Japanese tried to swallow is much hotter than they, uh, they bargained for, M much uh, more difficult to digest than they, than they uh, assumed. So, what kind of conclusions can we draw from this, or how can we generalize this? It seems like the translators were correcting um, Weida Sun, the screenwriter's misunderstandings. Misunder uh, Weida Sun just misunderstood uh, a Sa'idic culture or Sa'idic uh, geography, and the translators were correcting him, and that's why they changed things. Well, that's a good thesis. And that's the thesis that I tried to argue for about uh, a year and a half. When I was doing this research, everyone has a uh, research question, like, what were the translators doing? Why did they change these things? Were basic, was basically my, my research question, and my answer was because they were correcting uh, Wei Sun's cultural uh, misunderstandings, misunderstandings of their culture. Um, and I had a couple of examples of this. One was uh, Gan Kuai Tao in the Mandarin, and that means, hurry up and flee, run away, the enemy is here, flee. But I talked to the translators, actually I talked to uh, one translator, uh, Iwan Betty, and she said she did uh, oral history research uh, with older hunters in her village, and they said, no hunter would ever say flee. 
Anyone, any hunter that said flee in the face of the enemy would be a coward and would never be able to live it down. So I wondered, well, why would the word exist if nobody would ever use it? And I thought, well, maybe you could say the enemy ran away or the enemy fled when they saw us. They were so afraid of us that they just turned tail and, and ran away. But it still seemed rather kind of implausible that uh, a, a warrior would never use the word uh, flee. The equivalent of the word flee in their language was, was uh, kudurek. Kudurek. Here it is. It's harder to say Q at the beginning of a word than it is to say Q at the end. But there's Q at the beginning and Q at the end. Okay. And um, so I, I thought... I thought I'd better keep on doing some, re some more research, and so I asked the other translators. I asked, uh, um, I asked Akis, is this true, that you can't say this word because it would be humiliating? And he said, that's what Ewan, that's what Ewan said. <laughs> that's what Ewan said, so I'm not really sure, but that's what Ewan said. And then I, I asked uh, Bawa Nawi, who is a hunter. Uh, Dakis is not a hunter. He's never learned how to hunt. He doesn't hunt. Uh, but uh, Bawa Nawi has, has been a hunter his whole life. And he said, <laughs> He said that you would be an idiot not to say flee if the enemy was there and you're sure to lose. I mean, there's a fine line between flee and hotwe, right? And, and uh, how would you say hotwe in, in English? Retreat. Retreat, yeah. So there's either ignominious uh, retreat or uh, strategic retreat. And for him, kudurik is a kind of strategic retreat. And of course, you, you would use this word if you were in danger. You would find a better place to fight or fight another day. So, I started to question my thesis that the translators were correcting cultural misunderstandings, especially when I checked the film, because in the film, in the scenes in which uh, this guy, Bawa Nawi, appears on the left-hand side, he says, Kadodik, as a translation for Genkwaipao, or hurry up and flee, hurry up and run away. And all the other examples ended up being the same thing. One of the translators would say, oh, the uh, screenwriter has misunderstood our traditional culture. Um, and so uh, we, we tried to correct him in, in our translation. Uh, another example was uh, Tsai Hong Chao, uh, which means Rainbow Bridge. They um, get to the end of life, and if they are qualified, if they have become real people, then they cross the Rainbow Bridge into the afterlife. In uh, Sa'idic, it's Hako Utok, Hako Utok, which means spirit bridge. It also means rainbow. It either means rainbow or spirit bridge. It doesn't mean rainbow bridge. The spirit bridge is not a rainbow bridge. The spirit bridge appears at night, and it's a ritual bridge. It doesn't take the form of a rainbow. But they happen to use uh, Hako Utok to refer to rainbow as well. So, by using Tai Hong Chao, um, uh, Wei De Sun has misunderstood Sa'idic culture. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I did some interviews, and I found people who believe that uh, native people, Sa'idic people who believe that the, uh, the spirit bridge is a rainbow, that the bridge that you cross to get to the afterlife is a rainbow. And I checked Japanese ethnography from 1928 or 1929, and according to this Japanese ethnographer, it's a rainbow. The spirit bridge is a rainbow. The bridge that they cross at the end of, of life to get to the afterlife is a rainbow. So it seems like there are differences of opinion in the Sa'ida community, and you can't say that the uh, screenwriter and the director of the, of the movie is misunderstood. Uh, Jiao is the third example. It means proud, uh, but apparently in their language they don't have a positive word proud. It's only negative, like, oh, you're too proud, or death be not proud negative use of, of proud, but not when you feel proud of your children's accomplishments. That's a positive kind of proud. So the word is pusukuburo in Sa'edic. It's not a good quality in a rainbow, in a, in a rainbow, <laughs> in a warrior. You should translate it paru pahong, paru pahong, which just means uh, big. Paru is big and pahong means uh, guts or courage, but actually it's your goal. Your goal, like this guy's got a big goal, you know, it means he's a really courageous person. He's not afraid of anything. And so I thought, well, why didn't you just translate it Badu Bahom? Why not just translate it Badu Bahom? And that's related to, to, to pride. How is it related to pride? Well, if you have a big goal and you're a courageous person, you will do amazing things and, and your father will feel proud of you. It's related somehow. 
And a lot of things in translations are, are related somehow. It's not a, mid, uh, it's not a uh, mistranslation because it is, as I said, related somehow. So I looked at their translation and they did not translate it Baruch Bahom. Often when translators say what you should do or what they did, it's actually not what they actually did. So I took a look at what they actually did. I found a lot of really interesting examples. So this is uh, Ja'a. This is um, Mona Rudo, the chief that launches this rebellion. And this guy is called uh, Taro Nokan. If you can see him here, he's another chief. And he does not want to do it. He thinks it's a bad idea to attack the Japanese. And so uh, uh, Mona Rudo convinces him that it is a good idea. How is he con con going to convince him? He says, uh, we're going to do it for the sake of pride. I mean, I know the Japanese are going to come and kill us all, but uh, we'll be proud. I guess if in the afterlife we can be proud, and our descendants will be proud of us. So this is uh, kind of a rhetorical appeal to uh, Tadanokan to get him to agree to uh, join the coalition that attacks the Japanese. Okay, and so how do they translate it? Uh, Sunu Raman uh, Utuk. And um, <laughs> so uh, Ram is, a, is the root of the word. Uh, prepare is what it means. Actually, it means in advance or prior. But they add all of these other um, uh, suffix, uh, prefix, and infix to it, and it means that uh, the spirits, or here, utuk means spirit, or spirits, the uh, spirits are ready for them. <laughs> the spirits are ready for them. How is that related to pride? Well, if, this, if the spirits are ready to welcome them into the afterlife, it must be because they have done something worthy of pride, uh, something that makes the spirits proud. I guess the spirits are proud of them, and so they are ready to welcome them uh, into the afterlife. So it seems here that this is evidence that they are correcting uh, Wei De Sung's misunderstandings. Here's another example. Now, uh, Basically, this is, um, that's Hwagang uh, Ilang, Hana Oka Ichiro. He's a, a native police officer that the Japanese trained uh, to be a police officer and a teacher. And then he ends up taking part in the uh, rebellion. Right, so he's a major figure in, in, this, uh, in this incident. And he doesn't want to go through it either. And so Mona has to convince him too. How is Mona going to convince him? What kind of rhetorical appeal is he going to use? He says in Mandarin, Now If you force us to accept your idea of culture, your Japanese culture, then we're going to show you the pride of the savage. And if, if it were you, you might just decide to sign up. And this sounds great. Yeah, the pride of the savage. That's something I can get behind. That's something I can support. So let, let, let me show you uh, the pride of the savage. I will take you to see the pride of the savage. How do they translate it? Maha, nami, na, sumuneguen, gaya, gaya means tradition or culture, rudan, nami, keisun, 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 namu, gaya, tamats. Tamats is wild animals or the place that they live in. So it's outside the village. It's kind of like wilderness. Uh, okay, so how does that translate? Uh, all right, so if you force us to accept your culture, your Japanese civilization, uh, we will follow our ancestral tradition, which you call wild. <laughs> so uh, where is pride in there? <laughs> ancestral tradition? Yeah, it's in there somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> they, they, they just didn't translate it. So they're correcting his cultural misunderstanding of us. The crucial thing here is that um, they refuse to call their tradition wild or savage. Mm -hmm. For them, it's just as much uh, a civilization as Japanese civilization. I mean, today, we talk about multiculturalism. All cultures are, are equal. And that's uh, the idea that they're expressing here. You can't call our civilization wild. Wild is where the animals live in the forest, in the wilderness, on the mountain. So they're not willing to describe their own culture as, uh, as savage, OK? Isn't that cool? I just when I discovered these uh, mistranslations or there these um, sh uh, shifts in translation, 
I thought, God, this is fantastic. <laughs> Turn this into a book. Uh, okay. Here's another example. Uh, this is a, a song that Monoruto, the chief, is singing with his father. He's departing there, and there's a rainbow in the distance. And uh, the father has come to make a rhetorical appeal to Mona. He's saying, Mona, don't give up. You can do it. Your uh, tattoos are, you get tattoos after you, after you head hunt. You get tattoos. And they show that you're a real man. Your tattoos are still shiny and black. So I, I know that you've got what it takes. And, uh, so, and then they sing the song together. And this translates into a proud person is walking uh, near. A, a proud person is walking close. How do they translate it? Nima riso kakia. Nima is to whom or whose. Riso is youth. Ka, kia, ka identifies the word that comes after is the subject. So kia, that. Whose son is that, basically? Whose son is that? <laughs> so once again, uh, pride. Uh, disappears, but of course, if it's your son, it's the kind of person that you're going to feel proud, uh, proud of, right? Right. Want, we all feel proud of our, our children. If we have children. Okay. So it seems like more evidence that uh, Wade's son has just misunderstood uh, Sadic uh, tradition, especially um, um, the communal nature of uh, Sadic society. In the original, a proud person is, is like individualistic, right? Is this one person, this hero, that's done a great deed? But in the translation, it puts the, this person in a familial context. So I think that's interesting. You must be proud. This is after they launched the attack against the Japanese. And uh, Mona says, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Don't be afraid. Be, be proud of yourselves. You've already killed 134 of them. I mean, uh, you've done something here. You must be proud. And then uh, in the translation, Puku Udo, Lumen, uh, Namu, your thoughts, uh, make your thoughts proud. You must be proud in your hearts. Mm. How is thoughts related to hearts in my translation? Well, it's somehow related. I mean, thoughts are in your mind, right? Thoughts are in your mind. And your mind is somehow related to your heart, like in the word she in, in Mandarin. The word in, in, in their language is, is similar. It's both your emotions in your heart and your thoughts in your mind. And you'll notice here that they've used the word pukuuro. Do you remember it? Or have you seen a word just now that seems familiar to pukuuro? <laughs> Does anybody remember a word just now that was similar to pukuuro? Pukuuro? I mentioned also that there are two dialects in the film, or two sub-ethnic groups in the film, uh, Dodan Degadaya. Pukuuro is in Degadaya, does anybody remember the word that was similar, that is in Dota just now? Oh no, I actually, um, I actually put it here. So it, in, in um, this is in Dagadaya. And the same word in Dota is Pusu uh, Kurao. Sorry, so you, you just saw it. But it's not your language, and it's not a language you've ever uh, studied, so it's very difficult to remember words. Anyway, they, they use the word in the translation. So you must be proud. So uh, this example, uh, this example does not seem to support the thesis that Wade Sun has misunderstood Sa'idic uh, culture. In fact, it seems to support another thesis that the translators themselves maybe don't understand their own language well enough. They don't understand their own culture well enough. They don't have uliaku, they don't have corpora. When translators are translating, I'm translating in English, I don't assume that I know English perfectly. I'm always checking usages, I'm always checking etymologies, I'm always checking is this said more often or is that said more often, and I can use Google. But these translators just can't do that. So they retire, re rely entirely on, on what's called uh, yugan. Uh, this kind of subjective language perception, which can often be wrong, or it can often be different from the, 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 the average in a speech community. Because here, they've used this word that means proud um, in a positive way. I mean, it's obviously supposed to be positive. Be proud of yourselves. It's positive. It's positive in the Mandarin, and it's positive in, in this language as well, in Sa'edic as well. So this seems, uh, again, to... Um, undermine the claims made by the, uh, the translators. But then, we're halfway done.
More than halfway done. Much more than halfway done. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I now had a methodological problem. And based on my analysis, wait a second. You can't say that he didn't, um, yeah, you can't claim that Wei Sun misunderstood Sadic culture. The translators claim he misunderstood, um, but I don't, I don't believe them. I'm not persuaded by their claims. Okay, so my problem is, why, as a, as a scholar, am I arguing against the translators? Especially, I'm, a, I'm not a, a member of this ethnic community. I'm not myself Sadic, I'm not indigenous but I'm arguing against their understanding of their own language and culture. I'm saying, you guys, you don't even understand your, your, your own language and culture. Um, okay, so why was I doing this? Well, maybe just to prove them wrong? Oh, well, maybe, I don't know. Uh, and, or maybe to uh, vindicate uh, Wei Sun, saying, you have unfairly attacked uh, Wei Sun, uh, but he's actually right. No, but that wasn't my mo motivation. Um, so one thing I thought maybe I could do is to tell the translators that uh, they should adopt a more sophisticated understanding of language and culture. Uh, and I would teach them, right? I would be their instructor in cultural studies. So <laughs> culture, properly understood. Culture is not some unchanging e uh, essence. It's different for different people in different places at different times. And it's not the logic of our, our, our behavior. If somebody says, this is not acceptable according to our culture, it's because they want to persuade you not to do it. <laughs> people will still do it, right? Right, it doesn't dictate how people behave. It's a way of talking about how people behave and a way of trying to persuade people to behave in a certain way. And it's as much about lying and persuasion as about truth telling. And then again, so, um, is this a good kind of objective for my research? What right first? What right do I have to explain culture to the translators? It doesn't sound very politically correct. I mean, me ping some of Me ping some of And then I thought, well, maybe the translators, I mean, these people are not stupid. These people have lived a long time. They're educated. They're intelligent people. Uh, maybe they more or less know um, these uh, kind of postmodern claims about culture. And I talked to them, and they know it all already. They, they've already noticed that, that usages and cultural practices are different in different villages. They know things were probably different in the past. They know all of this already. They know that culture is constantly changing, that they've changed their culture. They've reinterpreted it. Um, okay, so uh, it turns out that they know it already. And I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm telling people what they know already. So what am I doing? I mean, this is a crisis in research. What, what am I doing? What is the point of all of it? Uh, <laughs> Can I salvage something from it? And so I, I turned to Clifford Geertz, when in doubt, in, in my long, dark, dark uh, what is it, of the soul, long, dark nights of the soul, I keep a copy of Clifford Geertz's interpretation of culture up by my bed in moments of despair. I, I turned to Clifford Geertz. So this is from Clifford Geertz. The concept of culture I espouse is semiotic, believing man is an animal suspended in webs of significance, see himself as fun. I take culture to be those webs, and the analysis of it, therefore, to be not an experimental science in search of law, but an interpretive one. Culture is interpretive. We interpret in terms of culture. And so I thought, well, that's, that's pretty cool. And this is already uh, 50 years ago. <laughs> um, and have you heard of uh, writing cultures in, in anthropology? Uh, cultural translation comes from uh, writing cultures. Uh, cultural translation comes from the 1950s, actually, from quite a long time before writing cultures. But writing cultures is a book, and it made cultural translation famous. And so today, everyone talks about cultural translation. It's because of, of this book, Writing Cultures. And so, um, in using this term, cultural translation, they put an emphasis on language. You can't talk about a culture without knowing something about the language. Most people talk about cultural translation, don't want to have to learn the language. <laughs> But actually, if you read uh, their claims about what cultural translation is, uh, you've got to learn the language. And you also have to adopt a kind of epistemological humility about culture, about what you know. Um, basically, the postmodern view of culture I just uh, discussed. Okay, so my, um, my topic, or my, uh, uh, rather my claim, therefore, becomes, rather than see their translation as a correction of the director's cultural misunderstandings, it's more fruitful to view it as an interpretation of the Musha incident and of uh, Sadic uh, culture in general. And I made this point, or I made this claim at the beginning, I'm gonna try and defend it now with empirical evidence. Uh, okay, so this is, Obushizai Saren, Obushizai Shijituling. These two guys are friends. 
uh, and he's Japanese on the right hand side. He is uh, sadic, and he's saying uh, basically, don't take this personally. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a really nice sentiment. I mean, if I if I had to kill my friends, I would want to be able to say something like something like this. <laughs> I'm doing this for my kind of cultural uh, to fulfill my uh, the cultural ideal of humanity in my in my culture. Okay, and so Shiji Zuling, it's a blood sacrifice to the ancestors. This is Wei De Sun's big explanation of why they did it. They, what were they doing? They were blood sacrificing to the ancestors. They were taking the enemy's blood in a uh, kind of big sacrifice uh, to the ancestors. Okay, and they translated Ni Ku Sumipak Seedek. I'm not killing people. Usadada, I'm causing to bleed. Utuk rudanmu, uh, for the sake of my ancestral spirits, our ancestral spirits. But he says mama. So I am not killing you. I'm causing you to bleed for uh, the sake of uh, my ancestors. They are the beneficiary of this uh, sacrifice. So they translated it literally. Wait, Daki Spawn published a book, and he said actually Shechi uh, Zuling. Uh, was wrong. It's a misunderstanding of our traditional culture. So I saw that he translated it literally, and I said, well, Dakis, why did you translate it literally? If it's a misunderstanding, why didn't you correct it? And he said, oh, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, and so I looked at other examples because it keeps on appearing in the text. So Shetizuling, this is the beginning of the attack on the Japanese. He basically says, what sacrifice to the ancestors? And everybody hears this, and they, they pour down the mountainside into uh, Usho, where all of the uh, Japanese are attending the sports day, and they start killing people. So the translation is bakpi, just means kill, and it's an imperative, so kill. Uh, kana, uh, all kana tunuk, kana tunuk means redhead, and it's because the Japanese wore red hats. The first Japanese they saw were, were uh, their soldiers who were wearing red hats, so kill all the, the Japanese people. So they did not translate it literally. Right, so sometimes you're translating it literally, sometimes you're changing it completely. What's going on? So I have to look at more evidence. So this is, this is evidence here. So uh, this is, um, I think Wadis is the leader of the Dota, the other group that were employed as, uh, as uh, headhunters. They were hired, what's that called? Uh, yeah, hired as mercenaries. Uh, and this is his Japanese friend, a uh, police officer who lives in this guy's village. So in um, in the subtitles it says Tailings, the uh, Gadaya is the Gadaya is the other subethnic group, the one that attacked the Japanese. Chen Zai Usha Shi Ti Zhu Ling Le, and this is spoken by somebody off screen. It's not one of these two guys. The person who's speaking off screen is trying to persuade uh, Ting Wallis to join the attack against the Japanese. The problem is that Ting Wallis is best friends with this Japanese guy. This Japanese guy ends up uh, persuading him persuading King Wadis to attack Monorudo and his people. He, he persuades Mona, Mona, uh, King Wadis to become a mercenary. Okay, but the issue here is what do they do with Shijizu Ling? They translated it, or rather the Chinese translates it into Mona has led the Digadaya to blood sacrifice to the ancestral spirits at Musha. Uh, and then he goes on to say, we have to join them. We have to attack the Japanese too. And in uh, Saedic, he says, Wada Dumudun means lead, Dugadaya, uh, De Dugadaya, and De at the beginning means makes it plural. Uh, Dumahur, and I've just put that as Dumahur, Utuk uh, Rudan Atzbia, which means the, uh, uh, the spirits of the elders of yesterday or of the past. And it's in, uh, in English, has led the Dugadaya, Mona Rudo has led the Dugadaya to Dumahur, the ancestral spirits. So I bet you're wondering, what is Dumahur? I'm going to create some suspense here, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you immediately. I'll tell you immediately. Don't worry. <laughs> Two more examples. When you shed blood. So this is a song they sing before they uh, slaughter the Japanese. Uh, when you shed blood, uh, our hatred disappears. And this is the whole point of uh, head hunting. If the, whole, the whole point of this blood ritual is when you kill the other guy, you're not enemies anymore. You become friends, and you bring, you bring his severed head back to your village, and you feed it with uh, whatever rice or millet, and then they, you, you give it wine to drink, and then it ends up becoming part of your community. 
And uh, let's look at the translation. So, Gumadaraku, I uh, make bleed, make you bleed. Mahidu, it means finish. Ta, we complete. Uh, Dumahun, and the ta here is we, and it means uh, I kill you, and then you and I together will com the, com complete this, this ritual. As soon as I kill you, we complete the ritual. It's, it's also a nice sentiment, I think. <laughs> okay. I make you bleed, we complete the Mahar. And the third example, this is Mona uh, in the speech to rally the troops after the, uh, the incident, kind of like Satan in, uh, in hell uh, in uh, Paris Lost, rallying, rallying the troops, don't give up. And in English, in Chinese it says, I would come home, I remember, the first time I headhunted, I would come home as a hero and uh, I would uh, receive the feast. Everyone would feast me and celebrate my great deed, and uh, I would become a true human being, a, a real man. So how did they translate it? I'd be taken by them as a true man. Everyone would say, true man is here. He is headhunted. He is now qualified to be called a true man and to be tattooed on his face, uh, which shows that you've become a true man, a real man. Dumahun, uh, Dumahun, uh, Seedek Alam. Alam is uh, community, a uh, village community, Dumahun. So Dumahun again. Here it's Dumahur, that's Doda. And here it's uh, Dumahun, Dumahun is uh, Degadaya. So they're cognates, it's the same word. So what is Dumahun? Now I'm going to tell you. It's a blood ritual. So she, Adaki said uh, She Chizuling was. A, blood, a ritual to the, the sacrifice to the ancestors is a misunderstanding of Sa'idic culture, and yet they have a blood ritual to the ancestors called Dumahun. <laughs> and it's as if Shi Zuling is a translation of Dumahun into Mandarin. Blood sacrifice to the ancestors is a translation of Dumahun into English. And it's a specific kind of blood ritual. It's a blood ritual of reconciliation, interpersonal. So if I, if I, uh, Offend uh, like Jewel, because uh, I, I go around offending people. This is just kind of I'm, uh, from a Tsujin Dai. <laughs> is that the expression? I'm always I'm always stepping on people's toes, and so I would take a chicken and uh, some uh, millet wine, and I would go to you, and I would uh, slit the chicken's throat, <laughs> and the blood would spill out on the floor, and I would give you uh, some millet wine to drink, and the ancestors in heaven above would see the blood and would bear witness to my uh, apology. Would you accept? Yes. I'm on my hands and knees. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, do I... Jewel is just my, my example. I'm always picking up. <laughs> hey, um, so it's interpersonal, but it involves the spirits. It can also be between villages, and I heard a really cool story from a, a, a former Catholic nun who talked about uh, a murder. There was a murder between two Chinese guys, but it happened on the, on the village community, on the reservation. It happened in the reservation. And uh, one person in the, in the village community said, we have, to, we have to conduct this ritual to tell the ancestors that it has nothing to do with us. It's the Chinese people who kill each other. It has nothing to do with us. It's not our fault. Don't blame us. But the young people in the village, they said, oh, come on. I mean, oh, that's just tradition. That's just superstition. And so they didn't conduct this ritual. And she said, but uh, for ever since, for 30 years, uh, men in the village have been dying young liver problems, or, or they say it's liver problems, but I know for sure, a former nun said this, I know for sure that it's the ancestors are displeased with us. All right, so the ritual of reconciliation always involves the, the ancestors, bearing witness. Okay, and so it can be uh, between humans and spirits, between human beings and ancestral spirits, it can also be between God and human beings. Most of these, these people are now Catholics or uh, Presbyterians or Church of True Jesus. They're, they're Christians, one kind or another. And they use uh, Dumahun to refer to Christian communion. So they've changed the meaning of the term in, in, in the intervening 80 years. And uh, they're another term for kind of a single uh, a single uh, overarching or most powerful spirit is Utuhatumaninun, which means the spirit that wove the uh, lines of life, the spirit that wove our, our lives. Uh, and perhaps originally it meant uh, animal spirits. It was perhaps originally a, a ritual between animal spirits. I hope I'm not going to offend any Christians in the room, but it's been argued by, by certain sociologists that the Christian communion is originally a, a hunting ritual, and that uh, the blood in the body is the hunted animal, the prey animal, 
And so you have to reconcile yourself with the spirit of the prey animal, say basically, sorry for killing you, <laughs> but if we don't kill you, we can't eat. And we hope that you can kind of share in uh, th this ritual of uh, consumption of food, that you're now part of my body when I eat you, but then you become part of the community. Okay? Okay, I hope I haven't offended anybody, because people's religious beliefs are um, to be respected. Um, so, my claim is that Damahun is also an insider's interpretation of the cultural cause of the Usha incident. So, according to the translators, why did they attack the Japanese on October 27, 1930? It's because they wanted to reconcile with the ancestors. The ancestors were angry at them because they had not protected the ancestral lands and the hunting grounds. They had cut down the, all these trees from which they were descended. The ancestors were not happy with them. They were showing the ancestors they still had uh, the ability to pre protect their traditional uh, hunting grounds and, and villages. They were also reconciling with the Japanese. By killing the Japanese, they reconciled with them. There'd be no more hatred between the two groups of people. Uh, it's also a key word in cultural, say, cultural development in, since 1930. I already mentioned that it's the, the word for communion. It's also the word used for four reconciliation ceremonies. The most, uh, one of them in 2010, uh, attended by President uh, Mainjo. And so, reconciliation in 2010, um, who do you think would need to be reconciled in 2010? Eighty years after the incident, the year before Sadegabalai, the film was released, who would need to be reconciled? Two tribes. Yeah, the two sub-ethnic groups. Exactly. And I've given this talk several times before, and you were the first person. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am... It's like, it's like the camels of the camels and who is it in Korea, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, sorry, carry on. Okay. Okay, but I'm, I'm moved, and thank you very much, and that's exactly right. It's, it's, a, it's a reconciliation between the Dota and the Digadaya. Remember that the Dota not only were mercenaries attacking the Dugadaya when they were defenseless in a, uh, in a refuge, a Sodom school. But they also got their land. All of the Dugadaya village lands and hunting grounds were given to the Doda by the Japanese as a reward. So, I mean, if you were a Dugadaya, you'd be kind of nursing a, grief, a grievance. You'd be, So it was, uh, there's need for a reconciliation ceremony. This is the one that Mainjo, um, Attended, and this is uh, a still from the documentary you're going to see. Uh, if you're still in the mood for a documentary, uh, at uh, at 3:30 or, or 3 or 3:30. So this is in 2010. Okay. Um, I said it's not just the at the beginning. I said it's not just an interpretation of the incident. It's an interpretation of uh, Sa'idic culture. Damahun is a translation, as it, in the translation may be an interpretation of the cultural cause of the incident. Uh, but how can you claim that it's an interpretation of Sa'idic uh, culture? That's a bigger claim. Well, here's my evidence. Uh, so they're singing their song. This is Mona and his father. We share in our village, basically. And the uh, translation is, uh, It should be my culture. Sorry, my culture. Sa'idic. Uh, and so then it's my Sa'idic culture, not our Sa'idic culture, but my Sa'idic culture is sharing there. Mududahun Tahiya. Tahir is we, and Hia is there. There in the, in the village community. What is Mududahun? Does it look familiar? Mududahun. Does that look familiar to a word that we just saw? Could it be familiar? Could it be the same? The same, not the same word, but could it be a cognate? Demahur, or Demahun, yes. Um, um, Sa'idic uh, verbs especially are built up from roots, and uh, so the root in, uh, in this word is H-U-R, H-U-U-R actually, H-U-U-R, and it's a ladle or a spoon. Uh, what do you use a ladle, ladle or a spoon for? To share. Uh, a, a wine, or blood, or uh, a rice, or whatever with other people. And so this ritual of reconciliation is also the word that they use for share. This is reciprocal. The two Bs make it reciprocal. We share amongst ourselves. We share with each other. 
we share with each other. We share the body of the prey animal. Uh, the prey animal shares somehow, I mean it's going to die, but it, it will share somehow in, in, in the ritual. And so basically they are defining their culture. They are saying our culture is sharing. Our culture is this uh, ritual of, of reconciliation. And they're not sh saying that because anybody forced them. I mean, uh, wait a second, the original just said, we share in our village. He's not defining how they, they can translate. He's not dictating how they can translate. They translate however they want. They translate it freely, defining their culture as the ritual of reconciliation, which at the same time is a ritual of sharing. So we should, uh, in, in, in conclusion, we should view these departures from literalism as Sadic attempts to make meaning out of the Musha incident in terms of words like Demo and, and Gaia that remain important to them today as they try to keep their culture alive and articulate an alternative aboriginal modernity, an alternative uh, vision of how to live in the modern world. And I think, uh, ultimately, this is why I'm, I'm doing this. I mean, I, I wanted to learn this language, and I want to make a claim in translation studies and kind of shake up translation studies. But my kind of, uh, uh, my personal motivation for, for, for studying indigenous peoples is that, that they all offer an alternative to our concrete jungle <laughs> our uh, screen-mediated uh, 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 lives. Um, so, final methodological problem is why not just uh, read Daki Spawan's book? If you're interested in his interpretation of the Musha incident, uh, or his idea of what his own culture is, why not just read his book? Zhen Chang Bala basically tells you. I mean, if you want to answer a question, you have to think, what's the best evidence you can find to answer this question? I mean, isn't this the best evidence? He wrote the book himself. Why use this translation? Just to claim that the translation is interpretation so you can, you can uh, write a book <laughs> about it? And My answer to this question is that it's important that he use uh, Sadik uh, to express his interpretation. It's important to me that he uses his own language, or his explanation is going to be slightly different in his own language than it would be in Manver. And I also personally think that his translation is more interesting than what he says in the uh, in the book, but I don't have time to prove that to you today. So, thank you very much. Mahoi, namu, bali. A previous speaker used uh, used this. He said uh, thank you individually, but it should be. Uh, oh no no no! He used the plural. I'm sorry. Mahoi, mahoi, namu uh, is you plural. Uh, bali truly. Uh, mahoi is you are generous. You you are truly generous. Is how they say thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, that was, again, that was um, a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, one of the um, things that was going through my mind was, um, what about the English translation in the, the English subtitles in the film? Uh, do they follow the Sadiq or the uh, Wader Sent original script? Yeah. Great question. The, uh, the translator from uh, Mandarin to English does not know Sadiq, but she... Uh, she uh, did her best and she consulted with Ducky's Bowen and others and did a lot of uh, research. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of serious problems in her English translation because she's basically relying on the, on the Mandarin. There are two articles about the English translation and they say that the English translator is closer to say the culture than the, uh, the Mandarin original. As if this English translator doing like a week of research is going to understand it better than Wade Sun who has been obsessed about the Musha incident since the 90s. So it's an unlikely thesis, and I, I, uh, I, I think I approve her wrong in chapter 6. Ah, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but by the way, did you talk to Wade? Uh, I talked indirectly to Wade. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask his assistance, and I'll say, um, Wade knows a little bit, like, pahuling is how they say hunt, and it's take the dogs, Pu is take, Mahuling is dogs. Mahuling is to take the dogs. It means hunt. Because you don't tell people exactly what you're going to do if it's uh, something sensitive mm -hmm. or security related. So it's, uh, we're going to, I'm going to take the dogs and you, you would know what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so we just going to explain that as uh, type. Um, <laughs> yeah, so he understands uh, a, a little bit. Um, and and yeah. did, did he get, um, was he particularly involved in the, in the process? Um, no, no, no. He delegated the uh, 
the task of uh, supervising the translation to, to others who did not know the language. Mm -hmm. the, the whole story is kind of funny. Um, like, okay, well, and the, the other thing that I was thinking about was uh, the audience of the film. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, what did uh, Sadiq, who actually watched this film, feel about it? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know whether anyone has looked at that, that question. Yeah, audience res response. Yes. We uh, say they got a local uh, response. Um, I mean, particularly, I mean, it's partly what the act, the pronunciation was like, and whether they were happy, whether yeah. they, they, the language was actually understandable. Yeah. Uh, Ewan Bedding, the, my friend, the one that introduced me to this stuff in 2011, she was really disappointed. Ah, oh, okay. And she was disappointed that uh, all this attention for Way to Sun, I mean, and the, like, the, the state. Basically, uh, the uh, CM uh, Jonging, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a na national uh, film production yeah. studio. They saved the film, they gave, uh, gave them half the funding. And in the film financing deal, the rights to the film are now uh, with, uh, it's not Parse Film anymore, it's the uh, uh, Jonging has the rights to the, to the film. The copyright is now, is now with them. And they gave them $200 million, uh, $200 million in financing. Um, yeah, what point was I trying to make there? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, so... Yeah. The local language and how they proceed to build it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, Ewan Benning was really disappointed with the language and with the fact that all this attention for him, mm -hmm. not for us, they should listen to us. Um, and uh, But I talked to other people who thought uh, uh, that it was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, the language exchange that I listened to uh, the film line by line, line with, uh, when we were listening to it line by line, there were a lot of lines he just couldn't understand. But uh, when he, he said he, he re-watched it again, not listening line by line, but just kind of paying attention, he said, actually, it's mostly very, very good. And mostly I can understand what they're saying. Um, subtitlers, anyone who's done the subtitling will know what that's like. <laughs> but often when you watch a film, you don't catch every line, even, even though it's in your, your own language, even if it's uh, in your own language. Um, and uh, the, the audience response is divided depending on whether you're Dugadaya or Doda. Um, <laughs> which, because many Doda, Doda people have said that actually uh, the, the film is biased against them. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, sympathetic to the uh, Dugadaya, but not to the Doda. It's critical of the Doda, because they were, after all, mercenaries. But I've watched the film hundred times, and I think the film is pretty balanced. Uh, and that it's critical of Mona Rudo. Uh, it's also sympathetic to uh, to the the Doda chief uh, King Wallace. There's all sorts of different perspectives on the incident in the movie. Okay, we better yeah, go ahead. I'd like to pursue. Um, I'd like to pursue David's question rather than what, and just now I give him why it matters more. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, 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 I'd say it's not just whether you can understand it. It's you know, it's, it's whether. It, you know, it it it's, uh, it conveys in the language. And can I just for a moment jump outside to a couple of, an example elsewhere? Well, for, for example, there was a film by Turkish director Kapanoğlu at the London Film Director Festival that did not go down well with most people in, in English because it, the, the English was Latin. And uh, I remember asking him, I said, "Well, you know, why did you?" You know, directing the actors in a language that you didn't understand. He said, "Well, it doesn't matter because they didn't understand English either." Um, and however, this film won the top prize in Tokyo on the basis of the total of Japanese subtitles. Yeah. So, um, Same thing happened here. You know, I mean, I think top directors like Renoir and Bergman have failed outside their own language, but other people have a different view on this. No, but there's a power thing here, you know, because you know, I'm, I, I'm an English reader, and I'm, um, uh, you know, and I'm judging it on whether it's good in English. Well, initially it was an English film, uh, which in all these cases are. But um, you know, nobody's judging this film spoken in Sedic and, and, and sorry, the other language um, on the basis of. You know this little audience who actually, you know, you know, and, and just simply. I mean, yeah, I could understand most of Cap Capanoli's film, but it was just 
in English, you know, it was so, it, just understanding it was not sufficient in that sense. So, you know, yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot more on the language reception side that, you know, obviously, you didn't have time to go into. Yeah. The, I, I did say that one line was translated literally. Um, Pusudara uh, Utuk Rudan was a literal translation of uh, blood sacrifice to the ancestors. Um, and so maybe that sounds Latin in uh, Sa'edic, but they also translated it in all sorts of other ways, uh, which, uh, based on my outsider's uh, uh, view, uh, are, are perfectly fine in, in Sa'edic. In, in translation studies, it's domesticating and fortinizing. It's a guy called Lawrence Benuti has popularized this, uh, this vocabulary. A literal translation is uh, fortinizing a uh, a free translation is domesticating. The domesticating usually is the kind of translation we're looking for, as long as it uh, uh, conveys uh, a pro a, a, an accurate idea of, of the original culture. This is a uh, it's a different case here. Like Venuti's example is Italian. Translating Italian into English, you make it sound English, right? But in doing so, you miss subtleties in the Italian. And so if you're an Italian translator, you feel shit. But these English readers were, were babying them, or, or they're, um, were they're were digesting it, or making it easily easily understandable. We should translate it in a more challenging way to force these English readers to learn something about about countries um, that speak different languages. But in this case, the original is Mandarin Chinese about about the Edic. So um, um, so domestic translation domesticating translation is easier to defend in this case, right? Yeah, okay. okay, very simple question. Uh, has the land been returned to the no. uh, to Gadaya? City? It never will, no. No. Never will? You, you're pretty um, prophetic then. You, they, uh, they, they still occupy the land and uh, it's 80 years and uh, actually when they have these reconciliation ceremonies, the idea behind it is from the Doda. It's like the Doda don't think they've been forgiven. So come on, come on, we're going to reconcile. If they've had this four times, why would you have for reconciliation ceremonies unless you, you don't think that the first three have been, been successful. And so the attitude in the Degadaya was like, oh, we've done this already. We don't need to reconcile. It's okay. It's over. It's in the past. We've got our, we've got, they've got three villages. And, and they say, well, okay. The younger generations the often generations disagree say, with decisions made by older generations. Yeah, or decisions made by the colonial power at the time and then uh, not uh, changed by the, the uh, Chinese nationals in 1945. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this almost like uh, a detective story. Uh, again, it's mm -hmm. sort of why you trace and, and peeling through all the traces. Yeah. But my, I mean, the fundamental question is because the original script was written in Chinese. Yes. If you look at the Chinese people back, I mean, the the way. The writing is not very good. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder why uh, he was there any was there any uh, uh, process of involving the uh, the Sadiq or, yeah. or you know uh, to 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 even give any advice in the writing process before yeah. the shooting. Yes. And why they still got this kind of uh, double, sort of, uh, sometimes totally not the same sort of context in the translation. What do you mean? For example, um, in, this, in the film, what it says actually is not the Chinese script. Yeah. So why was the case if this being consulted uh, before the shooting? Okay, yeah, I mean, if, if in some cases, it doesn't seem like they're correcting his misunderstandings. Why didn't they do that before the shooting? Yeah, why did they correct the Chinese? Yeah. They tried, but uh, he, he uh, insisted He insisted on Xie Jifuling. I mean, he thought this would communicate, uh, would, would make the, the film uh, effective in the theater. Just with subtitles, they've all, all they've got is subtitles, so there's no chance to get into any kind of subtleties or nuances. So Xie Jifuling, Blood Sacrifice of the Ancestors, it's usually it's four characters, it's very concise, it's, it's classical, it's kind of literary Chinese, gets the idea across. Uh, and so they tried to change his mind about these things. 
but uh, he just, that's it. And they didn't have direct contact uh, with him. Uh, Dakis could talk to him, but for the most part, it was his it assistants handling the translation. Yeah. Uh, second, how, um, how do you know that it's, it's bad, uh, bad, uh, bad, bad, bad Chinese? Bad. I mean, I do write. Mm -hmm. But so, like, like, I know, if I say bad English, I say, it's terrible, it's written terribly, but then if you ask me, well, why? How is it bad? And it's, it's often it's difficult to say. Because it's something, I, I suppose, you might agree, or might not. It is not a real Chinese writing. Yeah. It is very awkward. Mm -hmm. It is not not even literal. Yeah. Not, not an oral language, nor a literal language. It's yeah. very it's maybe not good writing. It's, uh, one could uh, make the thesis that uh, his Chinese was intentionally weird intentionally to make it sound foreign, to mm -hmm. exoticize the Chinese. Well, you can say so. That's very holy, isn't it? Uh-huh. That's very holy. Right, right, if you have a foreign person in a, in a movie, he's speaking English, but he's got to speak English in a kind of, in a foreign way. Yeah. In an ethical way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, they're speaking English, but, uh, right. It's a little more of, exoticizing. Yes. Mm. The Chinese is exoticizing. Mm. Okay. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, any final questions before we have our, uh, our coffee break? Mm -hmm. oh, yes, go ahead. Yes. How many of the Tkadaya actually survived these two defeats? They were defeats? almost literally decimated. Mm -hmm. A thousand people, uh, maybe 150 left. 150 to 200. So is there a word for, for uh, when? 80% yeah. of your population survives? Uh, yeah. yeah, majority, but not quite decimate. Um, they were moved in 1931 to uh, Alan Guban. This will come up in the documentary if you're interested. And um, then not all the villages took part. Half the villages uh, were non combatants, like Switzerland. Uh, but they were moved in 1938 to make way for a Muslim war. They were moved to another village called uh, Ala uh, Nakahara, Dongyuan, which is just across the road from uh, Ala Guma. So it was a tough time for <laughs> these people. It's an endangered language, uh, very similar to Tagalog. Tagalog is spoken uh, as a first or second language by uh, maybe 100 million people. Uh, Adik is spoken by uh, under 10,000, so it's uh, 1,000 to 1. For every thousand Tagalog speakers, there's one Sadic speaker, probably over the age of 50, probably cannot speak it as well as Mandarin, probably does not use it uh, in daily life. So it's uh, criti almost critically endangered. Any more questions or comments? Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, hello, thanks for your presentation. I love it, it's very fantastic because I saw this movie. Uh, I need to read the subtitle, and I want to know uh, the Chinese subtitle, subtitle is uh, wrote by uh, Wei De Sun. That's right. Mm. Yes. Because the whole I story here. Where did he get all these uh, great lines from? Uh, this chapter, uh, chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So about the um, uh, the Chinese title and the subtitle, title, uh, subtitle, is there? Uh, I don't know. Is there a purpose? Is Chinese title is because only for uh, service for the uh, Han spectator? Because maybe if, if we really uh, change the Chinese subtitle to correspond the Zetic subtitle, maybe the Han spectator cannot really understand. Yeah. Or maybe there is uh, have some commercial intention in the Chinese subtitle. So yeah. Yeah, that's my question. The sub Chinese subtitle was to be supposed to be exotic. I mean, if it, if it were completely normal, fluent Chinese, uh, it wouldn't be persuasive to the audience because it's being spoken by people who are not speaking Chinese, by, by these uh, indigenous, uh, primitive, uh, so-called primitive people. Uh, two, even though it's exotic, it has to be easy to understand because it's only on the screen for four seconds to six seconds. 
and he wants to sell as many tickets as possible. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's amazing that he managed to break even. Um, um, people were willing to give him four and a half hours of their time, if you watch both parts, a four and a half hour film. Uh, but to learn the language, uh, it's 450 hours, maybe, to, to learn the basics. And, and uh, nobody besides me is. <laughs> Actually, there's a number of people. One of the great things about doing like uh, really uh, um, um, what's the Le Monde, the the Timu, and Le Monde, the New York Timu. It's like a, a topic not many, not many people are interested in. You find people that are interested in it, and it's like you'll go to the I'll go to Sweden to meet this guy, or I'll go to Japan to, to meet this guy. <laughs> find somebody like me that's that's uh, for some reason, for some reason may have just gone nuts. We've decided to just. That, to, to spend all this time learning this language, and we're not sure why. But have you found a few? I found a few. I just found some guy from England who's in Japan. I, uh, my 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 mentor's in Sweden. Um, there's another uh, lady in Japan. Yeah. So, if you know anyone? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, tweet. I tweet. Just another question. It's a follow-on from uh, what you said. Uh, are you looking at uh, Wiki? Uh, I think it's Wiki Commons. Uh, so there's lots of um, uh, specialized, I guess we call specialized languages. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's quite a big movement. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to put the language on uh, wiki, uh, Wiktionary. Yes. That you can find Tagalog on Wiktionary, Cebuano, the other major language in, in, uh, in the Philippines. All sorts of languages are, are on uh, uh, Wiktionary. Hawaiian, Maori, they're all on Wiktionary. But these really endangered languages spoken by just a couple hundred, a couple thousand, tend not to be on Wiktionary yet. But there is, there is a movement uh, yeah. uh, coming together. There was a um, gathering in Aberystwyth University just last week. Uh, Aberystwyth. Uh, Celtic, oh. not. And they have Sami people there, and they're all working together for endangered languages, minority languages, and different languages. Wow, languages because of Welsh? Mm -hmm. Because uh, they're, they're saying that you know Google might, I, I can't remember this, Google might do something or something, and we, we need to be self, uh, in, uh, we have to fight. self uh, independent. Independent, okay. We need to have our own, uh, it's commons, it's called creative commons, yes. open source, uh, uh, open education, available. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tweed, for <laughs> uh, to, like, reach out to the wider endangered language uh, community. So it does remind me, what, uh, a few years ago we had Liga, Liga, Quay. He was giving yeah, a talk. The, the father of research, and he, um, there, there were others before the Uruguay, uh, but he is kind of the major um, figure in uh, Austronesian linguistics mm -hmm. in, in Taiwan, and he's written a lot of popular linguistics books about these languages are important. <laughs> but what really struck me from his talk was how pessimistic he was. And basically, yeah. he was giving us dates. Okay, how long before that each language is going to be extinct? But do, you, do you feel like yeah, that? That's my second book. About ah, okay. <laughs> in, in the revitalization of these languages in general. Uh, in uh, June of 2016, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the president uh, Tsai, uh, at the beginning of her, her uh, term, uh, uh, Pete Jun uh, um, promulgated a, a law called the Indigenous Language Development Act of uh, five times more money for indigenous language development which includes education. They now have uh, immersion uh, preschools, mm -hmm. immersion kindergartens. There is an immersion elementary school in a tile. And uh, so it, it's a start. It's not Greenland. In Greenland, you can go to, to university in Greenland. I think you can go to university in Welsh. Yes. Yeah, but it's, it's a start. Yeah, so it's unfortunate you, uh, one of our speakers um, uh, uh, last term, uh, Douglas Kulak, looking out. Um, I he had to be away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I want to um, meet this guy. Yes, uh, but that, that was the subject of his uh, PhD. He's doing Saisi and another indigenous language name. Yeah. Yes, okay, yeah, you have to make sure you, you catch up with him in, yeah. on your next visit. Um, any final questions before we break for... Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I heard uh, Wei Nelson want to make a series of movie about Sampo Chu. Yeah, wow. yeah. And how do you think about it? And can he do better than this one?
like avoid those questions, those problems? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, he's going to need a lot of money. Who's part? I think maybe he can crowdsource it. I'd give him some money. Yeah, yeah, he's he, doing that. He's trying to raise money, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was a bomb at the box office. His latest movie, his latest fundraising movie, uh, bombed. So we didn't make any money. Probably mm -hmm. lost some money. Uh, he's trying to make a, uh, a trilogy about the 17th century when the Dutch were there. And so it's Dutch and uh, Japanese and Chinese farmers and Suraya indigenous people. And we have uh, some idea what the Suraya language were, was like, because we have uh, some of the Shingang, Shingang, Wenshu, Shingang, Wenshu. We have uh, Dutch, uh, um, uh, was it uh, done by the Dutch? Were these documents done by the Dutch or by uh, Catholic missionaries in the early 17th century? It might have been Catholics that they recorded this language in, in uh, Romanization, in the Roman alphabet. And there's an Australian linguist that's publishing articles on what a uh, Soraya grammar would have been like, and there's a dictionary now. So it's possible they could try to, to make up a, some, some version of, of Soraya the way that uh, um, they've done this for other movies like Apocalypto. It was in um, uh, the language spoken in Yucatan. It was like kind of Maya, kind of Aztec. I'm not too sure, but but they tried to make it sound archaic. They kind of reconstructed a, a, some idea of or, uh, something plausible uh, how Maya was spoken in the, in the in the 17th century for Apocalypse. So they might try something like that for this film. But uh, Wade Sun's main goal here is not to be historically accurate. His main goal is to sell a lot of tickets <laughs> and uh, to kind of. Um, inspire Taiwanese people with a sense of national identity. I think that's the main purpose, yeah. above and beyond making money. Uh, Wei Yishun's main purpose is to inspire people with a sense of, to believe in themselves. You know, he's a Christian. In, in, in Sinai Kabbalah, there's all this stuff about the importance of belief. The, these people who attack the Japanese, they're basically uh, terrorists. I mean, we would call them terrorists, right? Yeah. yeah, they're terrorists. But they believe in themselves, they have, they have, they have a belief. And, and, and Wei Yishun is a Christian, thinks that that's really important. I mean, we don't have anything besides the market and make lots of money. I mean, I mean hey, I mean, I want to make lots of money. I want a house. I want an air conditioner. I want a car. But I mean, beyond that, what, do, what, what is it all for? If we're in a liberal democracy, uh, there's no pre-given, what is this for? So Wei Yishun wants to tell Taiwanese people that it's because we are the people that have this kind of history. Uh, we should be proud of it. Okay, uh, I think on that note we should take a, uh, a brief coffee break before our uh, screening of Pusu uh, Kuni. Pusu Kohoni. Oh, Pusu Kohoni. Pusu Kohoni. It's the a tree, the, the tree, oh. the origin tree. And, and Daryl will just say a few words at the start of that, of that screening. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Daryl one more time.